Hello, and welcome to Book Circle. I'm Earl Weinberg. This time we will continue our reading of Henrietta's War, News from the Home Front, by Joyce Dennis. My dear Robert, oh, excuse me, February 21st, 1940. My dear Robert, a few days ago I took Mr. Perry for a walk along the seafront as far as the rocks. You couldn't call it a spring day, but it was the sort of day which makes you feel that spring may not be so very far away after all. Mr. Perry, who hates the cold, was frisking along in a light-hearted manner, looking very handsome in his little coat, and a red shank on the marsh was giving its strange, questioning cry. I was just trying to decide whether it was saying why or who when I saw Faith running along the path toward me. She was gasping for breath, and her face was quite white. What is it? I cried. Mine, gasped Faith, seizing me with both hands. What's yours, Faith, dear, I said gently, for indeed, Robert, I had begun to think she had lost her reason. Mine, you fool, she shouted, and with one shaking hand, she pointed out toward the sea. Then she pushed me aside and rushed on. I looked where she had pointed, and there, bobbing up and down not far from the shore and drifting steadily toward the rocks, was indeed a large, round, black object. I stood rooted to the spot with horror and felt the palms of my hands go damp. Nobody in the world is more frightened of being blown up than I, but there is just one thing I am more frightened of still, and that is a big bang. To my mind, when threatened with a bang, there is only one thing to do, and I did it. I sat down on the ground, put my fingers in my ears, shut my eyes tightly, and began singing the Pilgrim's Chorus out of Tannhäuser as loudly as I could. Mr. Perry came and sniffed delicately at my ear, and I stopped singing for one moment to say, Go home, Perry, darling, and opened one corner of my eye to see him sa sauntering off in a nonchalant manner. Then I began singing again. How long I sat there I do not know, but it seemed hours, and I was beginning to get very hoarse when I felt a light tap on my shoulder and opened my eyes to see Colonel Simpkins bending down and peering at me with a red, anxious face. My dear lady, he said, are you ill? Without stopping singing, I pointed at the sea. The mine was now only a few feet from the rocks. Good God, said Colonel Simpkins, and then he began methodically emptying his pockets. First he took out a gold half-hunter watch, then his money, a note case, his ration books, and his identity card, and laid them in my lap. Then he removed his special constable's badge and put it with the other things. What are you going to do? I cried, but his reply was inaudible. I can't hear what you're saying, I yelled. Then take your fingers out of your ears, he shouted irritably, and began walking down the beach. Oh, don't do that, Colonel Simpkins, I shrieked. Oh, please, please, think of Mrs. Simpkins. You get down on the other side of that bank and cut along, he said kindly, and walked on. Oh, what a tiresome old man you are, I cried, capering about on the bank with my fingers in my ears. How could I cut along and leave him to be blown to smithereens? And yet, on the other hand, how, oh, how could I find the courage to follow him? Suddenly, a large wave lifted the mine in the air and swept it toward the rocks. I uttered a loud scream and took a flying leap down the other side of the bank. The next thing I remember was Colonel Simpkins forcibly removing my fingers from my ears and telling me that it wasn't a mine, but a barrel. I rather suspected it from the first, he said. Then why did you remove all your valuables, I said crossly, helping him to pick them up, for they were scattered all over the path. By the way, Robert, is there a special medal for special constables? Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. March 6th, 1940. My dear Robert, we have had a jumble sale to collect money for the sewing bee, which has sewn with such industry that it has run short of flannel. The sale was conducted with terrifying efficiency by Mrs. Savernack, and enough money was raised to buy flannel for at least a million hot water bottle covers, not to mention shirts and pajamas. Lady B says that had she known jumble possibilities, she'd have done one for herself years ago. We had a white elephant stall, too, and it did a roaring trade in India brass bowls, brass trays, and little brass figures of animals, which people who have now got to do their own housework have got tired of cleaning. 
Some of our drawing rooms now have a sad, depleted look, but better six Polish shirts than one Benares tray, as Mrs. Simpkins said bravely when she saw her favorite piece borne away by the charwoman. Faith took a fancy to a jumble hat and insisted upon buying it. Mrs. Savernack made her pay five shillings for it, though it was marked at sixpence, which I thought rather unfair, but Faith said it was cheap at the price. Lying there with the jumble, it looked an awful hat, but Faith gave it a tweak and a pinch and put it on her head and immediately looked like a fashion plate. And some people think her stupid. On Sunday, when I was out for a walk, a sudden gleam of sunshine on the sea made me sit down on the leeward side of the shelter to enjoy it. In there, already, was a master from the preparatory school, which had evacuated itself upon us, and some boys in red caps. He was reading to them out of the Sunday paper about the boarding of the Altmark, and if it had been a boy's book of adventure, it couldn't have been more exciting. When he got to the part where the sailors said, are there any British down there? And the prisoners shouted, yes. And the sailors said, the Navy is here. The little boys cheered shrilly. I wanted to cheer too, but I knew it would have embarrassed them if I had. Ladies mustn't cheer, so I didn't. Then the questions began. They jumped down on the Altmark's deck, didn't they, sir? Yes, Peter. With cutlasses, sir? Probably. Oh, sir, in their teeth, sir? They might have. Coo. I'm going into the Navy, said one little boy truculently. You'll have to work harder at your arithmetic, Colin, or you won't pass the exam, said the master rather brutally. You wanted to go into the Navy yourself, didn't you, sir, said Colin, pulling the master off his high horse with one fiendish tug. Yes, I got plowed for my eyesight. Didn't those chaps have anything to eat but black bread and tea, sir? Nothing. And no milk or sugar to the tea, sir? No. The Germans are dirty swine, aren't they, sir? Well, so are the Norwegians, aren't they, sir? Because they knew all the time our chaps were on board, didn't they, sir? Well, they are dirty swine, aren't they, sir? The master looked round the shelter like a hunted stag, and I got up and walked away. I thought he might find it easier to answer these questions if I wasn't there. My dear Robert, had you ever thought what problems this beastly war must cause to teachers of history who love both their country and the truth? Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. March 13th, 1940. My dear Robert, this has been marmalade week. Every housewife in the place has been going about with a wild look in her eye and sticky fingers. And as you walk down the street, a delicious smell of boiling oranges came wafting from kitchen windows. This year, thanks to our Adolf, it is a rough and ready sort of brew, and my heart goes out to dear old Mrs. Simpkins, whose marmalade, cut up by hand and with two pounds of sugar to every pint of pulp, used to be her pride and joy. Faith, who must be in the mode or die, became marmalade conscious for the first time in her life. Up till now, except for eating it at breakfast every morning, she has left the whole thing in the hands of her capable cook. But this year, sugar became a burning question so that it was impossible to ignore. She was further inspired by a picture in a sales catalog of a particularly fetching sort of smock entitled, When My Lady Goes A-Cooking, and sent for one in powder blue. I'm making the marmalade myself this year, she said nonchalantly one afternoon at the sewing bee. Every woman in the room laid down her needle and said, how much? Oh, about 80 pounds, said Faith airily, without looking up from the rather bad herringbone she was doing on a bed jacket. There was silence while people counted up the members of Faith's household and did a short sum in their heads. Where are you going to get the extra sugar from, said Mrs. Savernack, who always does sums quicker than anybody else. Aha, said Faith roguishly. There was a lot of ugly muttering in corners after this, and several people said that Ab Admiral Marsden, our food controller, who is one of Faith's most ardent admirers, ought to be reported to the police. Where did you get the sugar, Faith? said Lady B as we walked homeward afterwards, but Faith only laughed and asked us what she was pleased to, asked us to what she was pleased to call a marmalade route on the following Thursday. Admiral Marsden, whose hands round the bag in church, is one, of those, is one of those people on whose integrity one should stake one's very life. But when Lady B and I saw him walking up the drive in front of us on the day of the marmalade route, we both had twinges of doubt. Wonderful little woman, isn't she? He whispered to me in the hall. 
Wonderful, I said bitterly, thinking of my meager rows of jars, and Charles, to whom marmalade is dearer than life itself. In the kitchen we found Faith looking quite lovely in her powder blue smock, and the conductor looking fatuous. On the table was a pile of oranges which nearly reached to the ceiling, and a perfectly inadequate supply of sugar. Where's the rest of the sugar? said Lady B. Aha, said Faith. I wish you wouldn't keep saying aha, I said crossly. She's got some special method, whispered the Admiral, his face alight with admiration. I'm here really in an official capacity, as food controller, you know. Lady B and I exchanged guilty looks, to think we had so cruelly misjudged one who hands the bag. Ladies and gentlemen, said Faith, and the Admiral and the conductor clapped, I will now disclose my method, and I really can't think why none of you thought of it before. There it is. With a sweeping gesture, she pointed to two rows of little bottles on the dresser. Lady B picked one up and peered at it closely. Then she handed it to me in silence. It was saccharin. Faith was a little disappointed when we told her that her method wouldn't work, but took it in good part, and the marmalade route, which ended in making 30 pounds instead of 80, became quite a hilarious party with cocktails at the end. We, put on, we all put on aprons and helped. The conductor turned out to be quite a marmalade king in his way, and stirred steadily in waltz time to the jewel song from Faust. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. P.S. Lady B's granddaughter, Hillary, is home on leave. She has become a cook sergeant major in the VADs, and Lady B is entranced. March 20th, 1940. My dear Robert, whatever the meetings of our drama club may be, they are certainly not dull. Our club has the charming and original custom of leaving the choice of a play to the members themselves instead of to a committee. And though this leads to a certain amount of confusion and delay, it adds a good deal to the gaiety and excitement of the members' lives. And after all, what else is a drama club for? Now, about a play for the spring, said the chairman. Charlie's aunt, said Colonel Simpkins loudly. I suggest a Noel Coward play, said Faith, conscious that she had the clothes to carry it off. What about Design for Living? It's very improper, said Mrs. Savernack. It's very funny, said Faith. Whatever happens, we must keep this club clean, said the Admiral, looking as he does when he stands at the end of the pew, waiting for the bag to come to him. I always think Private Lives sounds a nice homely play, said old Mrs. Simpkins. Not that I've seen it, of course. What about Cavalcade? Wouldn't the train be rather difficult? At this there was silence until a stranger got up and said, Mr. Chairman, in a contralto voice which commanded attention, I could only see her top half, which hung with beads, and suggested that the bottom half had a longish skirt and sandals. Who's that? I whispered. Mrs. Weinbite, whispered Lady B, taken gorse view for six months. My suggestion for the club, said the new tenant of gorse view, is morning becomes Electra. Isn't that rather long, said the conductor, who was the only other person in the room who had ever heard of it. It lasts four hours, said Mrs. Weinbite. Good God, said Colonel Simpkins. I don't think people would like missing their dinners, said Lady B, who certainly wouldn't like missing hers. We might have a snack bar, said Faith. Ah, but would they let us have a license? Ladies and gentlemen, please, said the chairman. What is the subject of this play, he said, turning to Mrs. Weinbite. Incest, she said simply. Oh dear, said Lady B. I will have this club kept clean, shouted the Admiral. If this club isn't prepared to do good stuff, then it isn't worth bothering about, said Mrs. Weinbite. If you call a lot of perverted balderdash good stuff, madam, then I'm sorry for you, said the Admiral stiffly. Sir, you have just insulted my wife, said a little man shrilly from the back of the hall. Here we had the makings of a good row, and there is nothing our club enjoys more. Knitting was laid aside, and several people who had been asleep woke up and said what's happening in a pleased and excited way. I'm sure Admiral Marsden intends nothing of the sort, madam, said the chairman, but was interrupted by Mrs. Weinbite and her husband leaving the hall. I was surprised to see that she wore high-heeled shoes and a short skirt, which just shows that you can't judge people's bottom halves from their tops. 
Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. March 27th, 1940. My dear Robert, meat rationing is now in full swing. As a matter of fact, it has turned out to be a good deal better than we feared, but during the first week we were all convinced that we wouldn't get nearly enough to eat, and we endured strange and unnecessary privations. Never having been what you might call carnivorous, it was not the smashing blow to me that it would have been be to some, especially as I could have curried lentils and rice as often as I like. But Charles is one of those people who like what is called good simple English fare, which means two nice lamb cutlets followed by kidneys on toast, and in case the news has not reached you on your far-flung battle line, Robert, I may as well tell you that kidneys, though not actually rationed, are more precious than rubies these days. Though he is far too noble to grumble, he does look a little wistful at the unlikely-looking dishes which are put before him. What's this, Henrietta? Well, dear, it's a teeny tiny little bit of mutton mixed up with some spaghetti and tomatoes. I see. Lady B, who is a wonderful cook, is perfectly happy tossing up one delicious omelet after another. Mrs. Savernack, that woman of action, took out a gun license. She can't get meat at the butcher's, so she will go out and shoot it. The rabbits, which for years gambled happily in the fields at the back of the Savernack's house, have received a rude awakening, and Mrs. Savernack, flushed with success, has begun to turn her thoughts to bigger game. Farmer Barnes, wisely perhaps, has moved his cows to another field. But the one who is really enjoying the meat rationing is Mrs. Hweinbite. Not that it actually makes any difference to her, for she and the unhappy Julius have been vegetarians for the mo of the most violent order for years, but it gives her the chance to show off in the way vegetarians are so fond of doing. She wanders about the countryside singing folk songs with her hair coming down and her hands full of the most revolting fungi. Surely you're not going to eat those, said Lady B, her eyes wide with horror, when we met Mrs. Hweinbite one day in Harper's Woods. Why not, dear lady? Because they look poisonous to me, said Lady B. They may look poisonous to you, said Mrs. Hweinbite, but as a matter of fact, they are extremely nourishing as well as delicious. Julius and I have practically lived on fungi ever since we were married, and we haven't had a doctor in the house for ten years. Not once, she said, looking at me defiantly. I said, how nice. If everybody lived as we do, said Mrs. Hweinbite with triumph, your husband wouldn't have had any patience. I said I supposed people would still break their legs from time to time. Break their legs, she said scornfully, and made a dive for a vermilion mushroom growing from the root of a dead tree. Colonel Simpkins always does the shopping for Mrs. Simpkins, and I met him yesterday on the hill with his basket. Do you know what I have here, he said, holding, up, holding it up and looking at me with round eyes. Liver, I said. Tripe he said in a low voice. I believe it is very good if you boil it for several days, I said. But think of the gas, said Colonel Simpkins. Yes, indeed, I said. I must say, I never thought I'd come to tripe, said Colonel Simpkins sadly. Then his face brightened. If you ask me, he said, I think this rationing is simply awful. I had so hoped, Robert, that we were going to get through our first week of meat rationing without anybody making that joke. Always your affectionate childhood's friend, Henrietta. P.S. A phone message has just come for Charles, asking him to go at once to Gorse View and see Mr. and Mrs. Weinbite, who are suffering from gastric influenza. <laughs> gastric influenza. Ha! And we will hear more from Henrietta next time.